things that I'm going to be talking about. And uh, this book is essentially written by them. They send me letters to people with different heart conditions. And uh, I'll probably I'll just let it pass through here, and there may be some oil forms at the exit. So maybe I just process through that. Well, I guess. something. 
that uh, uh, shook me when I grew up mentally and uh, kind of shed away the uh, education that I received in the medical schools and never just as much as we see here. Here's a quote that I found in the textbook of veterinary pathology from 1958. The fact remains, however, that in none of the domestic species with the rarest of exceptions to animals develop atherosclerotic disease of clinical significance. It appears that atherosclerotic disease in them is not impossible. It just does not occur. It just does not occur. If the reason for this could be found, it might cast some very useful light on the human disease. So here we have two professors of veterinary medicine and summarizing their lifetime experience in a textbook. And that's their conclusion. Now, I'd like to talk about the answer to this last sentence here in a little bit more in detail. The single most important explanation for that phenomenon phenomenon is the fact that animals manufacture their own vitamin C, generally in huge amounts, between 1,000 and 20,000 milligrams every day. They do so by converting sugar molecules into vitamin C in their liver. They need a few enzymes to do that, and one of these enzymes has gotten lost in you and me and five billion other people. A few thousand generations ago. The fact is that none of the people living today can manufacture a single molecule of vitamin C. All the vitamin C we get is in the diet. Unfortunately, this diet is uh, deprived of vitamins, not only vitamin C, by our modern food processing, cooking, and other procedures. So, the single most important difference between the metabolism of of human beings and those of 99.99% of all other living beings is the amount of vitamin C in the body, genetically and in addition from the food. What is the single most important role of vitamin C with respect to cardiovascular disease? Well, many of you have heard that vitamin C is an important antioxidant. Um, Vitamin C is a cofactor for cholesterol metabolism has made the news. But here is the single most important one. And as obvious as it is, it rarely makes the news. Vitamin C stimulates the production of collagen molecules. Collagen molecules are the reinforcement molecules of the human body. Not only the bones and the skin are made of collagen essentially, but also the blood vessel wall. So here you see individual collagen molecules, each of them as strong as an iron wire of a comparable width. Here you see a cross section through a uh, um, artery, human artery. Everything white you see here is connective tissue. Uh, the great majority of the molecules that make up this connective tissue is collagen, elastic and some other. So, Here's something else that you know already, but maybe you have not made the association in the middle. We just heard that, vitamin, that animals don't get heart disease because they produce their own vitamin C in huge amounts. Um, and vitamin C stimulates the production of collagen. Many collagen molecules reinforce the artery wall of animals and no deposits develop. In this column here, yeah. in this column here, something, something else that is pretty familiar to you. What happened to the sailors 400, 500 years ago when they were on their long ship <coughs> voyages? They got scurvy. What is scurvy? Vitamin C deficiency, not quite. Scurvy is vitamin C depletion. The difference between deficiency and depletion. If your body is totally depleted of vitamin C, you get scurvy. Scurvy happens, or happened at the time, very fast. Within three to four months, 
sometimes five to six, and a little bit. These people, these sailors, died. What did they die from? And after five weeks, we had to sacrifice the animals and we cut open the 
aorta. So what you will see are the results from this experiment. Here is the heart, up here, here is the portion. This is the aorta, the part of the artery system that is right here. Uh, on the right here would be the object of the leg. So what you see here essentially is the artery wall of an animal that received, a group of animals on the representative here that received 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C compared to the human body weight. And here you have the 60 milligrams. Everything red, yellow, and whitish here are deposits. And just like in the human system, the greatest deposits are close to the heart, just in the human system, well, the little branches and orifices to the internal arteries, like the internal arteries, there is this deposit here because of the turbulence, the mecha and the mechanical turbulence. <coughs> Important for what I would like you to remember from this picture when we take it home um, are two things. Number one, only one single factor made the difference between the upper portion of this picture and the lower portion of this picture. Vitamin C deficiency. The second thing, not something too much made this difference. We didn't feed them more cholesterol, we didn't feed them more fat, more sugar, or fatty acids in different cut downs, monosaturated, polysaturated, whatever. Something too little made this difference. And this too little induced the body to produce these repair methods. Very important mental step. Very important. Of course, many of you now know also that uh, this is not just Dr. Rath talking, but there is a growing number of uh, clinical studies that uh, come into the news. You know, vitamin C uh, study down in Los Angeles with 11,000 Americans over 10 years. Vitamin C cut heart disease rate almost in half uh, in men and uh, about 40% in women. Vitamin E study at Harvard, 36,000 Americans over six years. Beta carotene also from Harvard Medical School. The bottom line is no prescription drug has ever been shown to prevent heart disease similar to these vitamins. I'm going to summarize our new understanding about the number one health problem of our time. It starts not with a dietary problem in terms of too much fat. It starts with deficiency, with lesions and cracks in the blood as well. Repair becomes necessary. Overshooting <coughs> repair leads to the deposits. And before I go on with the Reversal, I'd like to emphasize as a little bit. We've uh, I've just came from dinner with Harvey and we had this discussion, so I quickly added this picture because it was part of our discussion. Um, that summarizes in a graphical form what I just mentioned to you three minutes, five minutes ago. The body communicates. There is a telephone line between the blood vessel wall and the liver. And this telephone line says, I am weak. I am the blood vessel wall. I am weak. Well, I'm weak. I need repair. Could you deliver more repair molecules? More cholesterol, more triglycerides, more LDL, more lipoprotein A? And the liver says, yes, no problem. How long do you need it? <laughs> The answer is, in many cases, many years. And what this picture also says is that uh, the key to interrupt this cycle is not to lower cholesterol alone. The key to interrupt this is to remove the problem, basic problem. And that is to repair the instability of the wall or to provide stability in the wall. When we, the vitamin formula that I developed, some people report to us 
most people report with our cholesterol drops. And that makes a lot of sense if you look at this picture. If you take cholesterol, the telephone says, I don't need, I have a stand situation, I don't need to repair molecules in the room. So you don't have to repair. Am I talking too too low? No. 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 <laughs> don't take us serious if you talk like that. Um, the, uh, so if you take the vitamins, in most people it will decrease the amount of cholesterol, amount of triglycerides and most other risk factors you can measure in the bloodstream because most of the risk factors clinical cardiology today knows are repair factors. However, in some cases people report to us and say our cholesterol level rises. How could that be? Now, well, if you take vitamins and the cholesterol level rises, what happens? We lost the circuitry around. We're pushing on the earth. Here's what happens. This is the wall schematically with strong and vitamin C reinforced. This is a vitamin C deficient blood vessel wall. And here you see the atherosclerotic deposits, nothing else than a plastic cast scaffold. Now, if you start to stabilize this wall of vitamins, this plastic cast can be torn down. And that's where the cholesterol comes from. And you measure it in the plastic. And if these people go on for four, five, six months, their cholesterol blood level will drop below the inclusion level. This mechanism is not new. It was first described in Lancet in about 1972 by a, a British researcher, a, a, a professor of Constance Spittle. But it's very exciting to see that confirmed now in, in essentially with the new uh, interest that comes about with the Indian violence. I see some uh, doubtful faces here, but uh, let me give you a little ammunition here. A little possible. Why are bears not extinct? <laughs> Well, what's the background of that hospital? Bears have cholesterol blood levels above 400 milligrams per decimal, on average, not as an exception. And even bears are not the only animals. Most hibernators have the same levels. Why? So what's the problem here? If cholesterol would be the culprit that damages the blood as a wall, leads to the deposits, as we always read, we would just, by pure logic, have to assume these guys who die from heart attacks and strokes, essentially they will be gone because they died long ago. So why are they still around? You need vitamin C. They what? You need their own vitamin C. They make their own vitamin C, correct. They produce their own vitamin C in their livers, which stabilize the blood vessel wall, and this wall says, I don't care about 400 milligrams or 500 milligrams of cholesterol. Now, Dr. Raff doesn't tell you that. <laughs> that is just an example here that is, again, something for, for the mind. Uh, I still think that uh, if somebody has cholesterol levels, uh, elevated cholesterol is about 260 and above, uh, that there's a lot of uh, reason to, to lower that. There are many natural ways, as we all know, to do that. And in addition to the vitamins, there are fiber products and many other things. Yeah. What? But as a, as, a, as a mind experiment, it is very important <coughs> to understand this sample in the following way. I do not agree with the multi-billion dollar industry that makes half a nation sick with cholesterol levels of 220 and 240 milligrams per day. And for them, I'm using this picture. Now, some of you may know that we, something exciting happened about two years ago. We got the first patents to reverse cardiovascular disease naturally. And that is truly something very exciting because it involves vitamins and 
other essential nutrients. This picture here summarizes very briefly the technology behind that. Um, Lipoprotein protein A is one of the most um, greatest risk factors, most dangerous forms of cholesterol vehicles we know today. Why is that? We all know cholesterol is not transported in the blood like fat in the soup. It is transported in round little particles called lipoproteins. And these lipoproteins, they transport cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, uh, phospholipids, and a lot of fats through the bloodstreams. And millions of these particles circulate in the bloodstream and have specific functions. However, one type, one subtype of these lipoproteins is particularly malicious because it has a sticky protein banderola around it, a, a, a long protein that makes this fat lot more sticky. Um, I'm not going to go uh, into much detail on this protein because there's a lot of exciting things I want to share with you. But if you're interested in the background of that, it's in one of the books, Eradicating Heart Disease, the work we've done in Hamburg, and um, uh, subsequently the exciting breakthrough behind this molecule here. Uh, but one thing I'd like to leave with you, why do you think nature makes a fat molecule that is sticky? Okay, you've got to stick to something, yes. So we come back to the repair idea. If you are in the shoes of nature and you have a species running around on planet Earth that has no vitamin C synthesis and has as a main problem the instability of the blood vessel wall with leakages and crevices all over, what would you do? You would think about how can I give these guys the best repair possible? And suddenly we understand why human beings are the only species we know today or almost the only one that has this specific, very sticky and very dangerous uh, form of lipoproteins, lipoproteins small a. Now, the, this is essentially the form how cholesterol is transported in 95% into the blood, the 95% of the people who get a heart attack into the coronary artery deposits. So this molecule is about uh, 10 times greater risk factor as cholesterol levels or anything you can measure. That's about the scope of this problem. And for us it was exciting to find a way how we can neutralize the stickiness of this uh, uh, protein and thereby prevent <coughs> deposition in the blood vessel wall. And the elements that are doing that, the teflonations, uh, are amino acids, lysine and proline. And uh, by doing by taking lysine and proline, you um, form a film, a, a teflon film around this sticky fat globules and do two things. Number one is you prevent the further buildup of atherosclerotic deposits by these fat molecules being deposited in your coronary arteries. And secondly, and more importantly, you do this. This is a schematic picture. The, the, uh, the picture you see in the background is an original microscopic view of, of a deposit in the coronary arteries. That's actually a picture uh, we've taken from, the, from one of the patients in Hamburg. Um, all the black portions you see here is a specific stain for lipoprotein A. So everything black you see there is this small molecule. Since you cannot see them, we met or I magnified them in these two molecules here. Uh, and by providing the lysine and the proline around these molecules, you detach them from their anchor places in the blood vessel wall and they are released into the bloodstream. In, in combination with vitamin C, that's, that's what the patent says, the combination of vitamin C with lysine and proline is, uh, is providing that effect, uh, preventing the buildup and the partial reversal of process. Now the combination of, of lysine, proline and vitamin C 
is also important for another reason. This is a, a, a schematic picture of the collagen uh, fiber that uh, makes up the uh, stability of the blood vessel wall. And as we know, collagen is a protein and it's built up of amino acids. And it's a very typical uh, pattern of amino acids that makes up this stability rods here. And that is lysine and proline. These two amino acids make 25% of the building blocks of collagen. So we have vitamin C that stimulates the production of the entire molecule. And we have lysine and proline that provide building blocks for the synthesis of these proteins. So we do see that nature makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm, I'm always coming back to that. If I give a talk, I want you to understand that nature is not, nothing happens that cannot be explained in our body. Everything happens for a purpose. So if we give the building blocks and the, the, the vitamin C that stimulates the production of this, then there's no wonder that these say, very same natural substances release the deposits. It's so logical. It's so logical. More recently, we developed and added to the vitamin program that we developed something exciting, and that is uh, a substance that is called chondroitin sulfate. Uh, again, this is a picture taken under a microscope. The, let's see what we have here. The um, brown portions here are collagen molecules magnified very largely here. And the chondroitin sulfate molecules are the black little threads that you see here uh, align in a very typical pattern. So this is not just put there. This is a conversion sulfate are aligned in a very systematic order between these uh, collagen molecules and help to stabilize the blood vessel wall. Um, another element that is important overall is the arginine. I'm sure that you talked about that before. So I won't go into much detail on that. The anti-clogging effect of arginine and, uh, well, nitric oxide split off arginine and uh, helps to prevent the clogging and relaxes the blood vessel wall. So let's quickly go to the program that uh, I developed uh, uh, about two years ago. And that is so, uh, I would say, encouragingly successful in, uh, in the has become in the meantime that uh, that we really compete with the doctors now mm -hmm. in terms of uh, of saying here's an here's an answer to the number one epidemics in your practice and if you read through this book America's most successful you must be not wrong. You may say, well, this is a nice title, but can you? That's a pretty challenging statement. Uh, I'm not afraid to use these words because if you have an opportunity to read through the book, and, uh, yeah, it's circulating here, you'll see the uh, um, response from people from different different cardiovascular problems. Thus far, in the last 25 minutes, I've talked about the blood vessel wall and the arteriosclerotic deposit. But cardiovascular problems include arrhythmia, include hypertension, include heart failure, shortness of breath, uh, edema, etc., diabetes, and many other things. And the understanding that I'd like to leave with you in the last uh, part of my talk here goes far beyond the arteriosclerotic and the cardiovascular wall around The understanding that we have to gain now in medicine and that we will gain is based on a new understanding of human health and disease. What, what do I mean with that? I mean with that, but 140 years ago, a German physician presented the idea that diseases start developing on the level of cells. Rudolf Virchow published a paper called Cellular Pathology in 1857. How did he, have, how, how did he come about that? 
there's a very simple explanation. The microscope was invented more powerful than the early microscopes too, but a powerful form of microscope was invented that allowed the doctors and scientists at the time to look into the human body and study diseases on the level of cells. So this guy, he just wrote down what he was seeing. He said, first thing, our problem starts is the cells have a different shape, a different form, so it must be starting there. Unfortunately, well, he, by doing that, he understood and defined the problem absolutely correct. The human body is made up of millions of cells, and any disease we know today starts at the level of these cells. What he couldn't know was, What's the main problem? What's the main reason for cellular malfunction? Why couldn't you know that? Well, the answer is vitamins and other essential nutrients. Efficiency in these factors are the single most important reason for cellular malfunction and disease. And of course, most of the vitamins, structural vitamins, were only discovered in this century, early this century. So you couldn't know that. But what one would, would assume, looking back now, we have the end of this 20th century and uh, vitamin C structure was discovered in 1930. So there were 70 years where scientifically it was known that vitamin C does. Biochemically it was known that vitamin C does. Yet we still run around on this planet and people die from a disease that they ought to die from. Right? So there was a big problem here that science and biochemical science and chemical science and technology, whatever you want to call it, brought us to a point that we, we entirely understood this problem. Vitamin C, collagen synthesis, 50 years ago. Yet, where was the application where into medicine? Where was the transformation into the textbooks of medicine? Where was the teaching in medical schools? Where was the application in the doctor's office? So, right now, we are at a point that we close this circle that started 150 years ago. Cellular pathology becomes cellular medicine. And this is, in one picture, uh, the summary of that. This is a, a, the, what I call the software. These are the biochemical reactions that take place in each cell every second. From, from one of these little black dots to get from one of these black dots to the other, you need an enzyme or catalytic reaction. Most of the vitamins are cofactors for these enzymatic reactions or for these biochemical reactions. Other vitamins provide cell fuel, bioenergy for these reactions. And what we do understand now is that if you don't have these vitamins or specific vitamins more important than others, but if you don't have this cell fuel, you are likely in one way or the other, in one portion of your body or in the other, to get malfun cellular malfunction and eventually disease. Well, if that is so easy, then we should be able to demonstrate that very easily by giving vitamins to people with different heart conditions and providing a remedy or curing them or, or doing things that no drugs can be done. Well, let's see what we can do that. Well, first of all, here's another picture of my, these are our pictures from my book, so you may want to just uh, read through that a little bit more in peace and quietness. But if you look at the blood vessel system, you immediately understand the dimension of what I'm talking about. Here's the blood vessel wall. The endothelium, the barrier cells between the bloodstream and the blood vessel wall are cells. The vessel wall itself, the muscle cells that are important for the stability and beauty configuration, Nothing else cells. The heart itself is filled up with muscle cells. Ninety-five percent of them have the job to pump, just to contract. That's their job. Throw up your blood like a pump. Another five percent or so have the amazing ability <coughs> to create and conduct electricity for the heartbeat. All of them are cells. No matter what their function is, what their specific kind of function is, they all need the same cell fuel. Right here. And even the blood cells, nothing else than the cells. So, I've separated, I've, uh, the, the letters I got were from so 
many areas of cardiovascular problems that I had the opportunity to separate them in, in into chapters. So there's a chapter on cardiovascular problems, angina pectoris, coronary heart disease, people with angiograms before and after. Um, and the answer is right there. On the left hand side, you see the problem deficiency and the cardiovascular cells, the cells of the muscular wall, the endothelial cells, loose muscle cells. The problems we discussed here, right here, heart attacks and strokes. And if you refill the missing cell through <coughs> these muscular wall cells, you are the stuff problem. <laughs> and that is the reason why people report, not as an exception, angina pectoris decreases four weeks, six weeks, disappears. Like they put their nitroglycerin away. Uh, people, uh, in, in, in some cases, they were scheduled for operations, bypass operations, eye operations because of circulatory problems. No operation more anymore. So things that are so unbelievable that I'm, I'm standing here and you look at me and say, well, he's making that up. No, I'm not. And the reason for that is if something is true, if something in science, a major breakthrough, major advance is made, then suddenly many things fall into place that were so, that, that just were so unbelievable before. Let's go, let's go on. The regular heartbeat. I don't know whether you saw this book uh, called Deadly Medicine, and uh, a very important book for uh, people to understand what's going on in medicine. Uh, there was an, an anti-arrhythmic drug uh, introduced actually a new group of anti-arrhythmic drugs. And people started taking them because uh, they thought they do they can prevent deadly arrhythmias with them. Problem was that this uh, this group of drugs actually did not only prevent this but they actually cost. So an estimated 50,000 people, about the number of people who died in the Vietnam War, died in America alone from taking this drug. And congressional investigation found out the main reason why that could happen, the reason why that could happen is because the FDA allowed the drug without any controlled clinical studies. What drug was it? Uh, the beta blockers? Uh, no, no, it's uh, a whole new family of. Uh, no, 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 no. It, it was not a beta blocker. It was not a beta blocker. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the uh, American uh, names of it, but uh, the, uh, it's a new uh, new class of anti arrhythmic drugs. Next to you is one of them. And, uh, is that the Procaine? No, no, no. Procaine, we don't. It's a, it's a new type of, of, of new type of antiviral drugs that uh, were supposed to help uh, uh, people who have some form of arrhythmia not to develop the form of deadly arrhythmia that actually can kill them. But these drugs they prolong they they, they prolong the uh, the conduction time so long that actually they they, they, they die. So that was the problem, but I'm, I'm saying that only to, to highlight this chapter here. From what we know today, well, if, you, if you open up the textbooks of medicine and look, what is the cause of irregular heartbeat? We don't know. We don't know. Yes, we know. The most important cause, the most frequent cause of irregular heartbeat is the deficiency of vitamins in the electrical cells of the heart. And it makes a lot of sense because the heart is pumping a hundred thousand times a day, day in and day out. Why should these cells not become deficient in, in vitamins and essential nutrients? Why not? Tell me. And if you read the chapters, people uh, are on under arrhythmic drugs, they got rid of it, they, they have for the first time in their lives no arrhythmia anymore, they just do the simple thing follow a certain regimen of vitamins and, and essential nutrients. This is dietary. Do you mean dietary? I supplemental as well. Well, 
Where's the dietary limit? Oh, the dietary dietary dietary. Dietary. Well, that's what I mean. Essential nutrients comprise of vitamins, uh, amino acids, magnesium, trace elements. Could you could need to take some little yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I'm, what I'm saying, uh, the question here is whether uh, I'm advocating supplements only or uh, the vitamins in a, in a uh, plant nutrition and, and vegetables, etc. I have a very good position with that. Get as many vitamins as you can get in your regular food. Number one. Number two, we have to admit that many of these vitamins, we, well, first of all, we don't get so many nutrition in form of fresh vegetables and plants that provide us an optimum amount of these essential nutrients. We just don't. It's an illusion if somebody says that the majority of the American population gets that. So we, we need something like this. Secondly, people with uh, genetic disorders or with a high risk, they need additional supplements uh, on top of the things you can you can do. So I have a very clear position. But let's go back to this. If irregular heartbeat is caused by the uh, depletion and deficiency in vitamins, then supplementation of these vitamins becomes the remedy. And therefore it's no surprise that uh, uh, people write these letters to me and I'm sitting there and say, Jesus Christ. <coughs> End of the 20th century, and the answer is so much more. Heart failure, same problem. What is heart failure? Heart failure is one of the most challenging medical problems in cardiology today. What is the fate of a heart failure patient? The fate of a heart failure patient today is to get a heart transplant operation or to die before he gets a new heart. Because there's no part of the name. And you're an ass backwards. <laughs> and the answer for that is as simple as the one before. Why is the problem coming from? Why heart failure is nothing else than a heart that normally contracts like that, suddenly contracts like that. So instead of a teacup of blood that is thrown out to oxygen in the body, it's half a teacup, even less. So you provide these cells with the, the, the cell fuel and they start pumping again. And people can walk stairs again and get out of bed. The, the most heartbreaking letters I got are in that chapter. People on the transplant list. People who have been hospitalized in the You lack the words.
found no solution. The school of practices, several rational problems, stroke, heart failure, high blood pressure, diabetes, go on and on. And now we now we suddenly understand that it's 80% that's the end. That bothers me. It bothers me a lot. It also bothers me because I'm, I come from that field from when I was trained as a medical doctor. I never heard these things. I never read them. Okay, so just to finish it up, uh, lifestyle changes. Um, I don't have to emphasize it, but people ask me generally, so I better put that up here. I think it's understood that healthy lifestyle, finding some regular exercise, time to relax, uh, generally healthy nutrition with fiber rich um, uh, nutrition and low in fat is the basis of any uh, cardiovascular recommendation. And on top of that, the things I've been talking about uh, are quantumly forward uh, for medicine. Lastly, uh, if there's any uh, patient here, I have to put it up here. Uh, please don't replace your medication without talking to your doctor at the, if you read the books, you'll follow the recommendation or at, at your own vitamins, add that to your prescription medication, then watch your health improve and then talk with your doctor how to uh, lower the things. Anyone wants to have more information, I welcome you to pick up a, a little information sheet on how to order the books at the exit. You don't have that uh, No, we don't. I just have this uh, thing uh, crossing around and, and um, that's what we have. I thought that it might be good to stop here with my talk and maybe we have some questions and, and answers and then we go for a little while. But I need to know from you how long we can go on, Zoe. Uh -huh. Nine points.
that are just a minimum daily rate recommendation, I have nothing to handle. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I just want to mention about calcification of the plot. This is a current test, the CT scan, which uses calcification of the heart. It's a particular plot. Do you have an opinion about that? Yeah. The question is what's the factor of calcium in atherosclerosis and can it be used as a diagnostic parameter of development? Uh, first question is the first answer to the question. The, if you take a deposits and other sclerotic deposits, we've done already like hundreds and hundreds of them uh, for autopsy cases, and weight the composition of them. Only about 5% is calcium. The rest is fibrous structure, cell elements, overproduction of collagen elements, um, and fatty deposits, like protein. So the uh, understanding that we have today is that calcium comes in at a very late stage of the problem and it's not something that is, uh, is the main part of the problem. It's, it doesn't make up calcium, does not clog your arteries. It comes in as part of the overall mechanism that, that takes place. Information and that's the answer to the first question. The answer to the second question can it be used as a diagnostic marker? The answer to that is yes. Uh, what we understand today is that calcium is not only deposited in the core of the lesion, that means in the very center, but dispersed over most of the atherosclerotic deposit itself. So, uh, Imatron, the clinic that does uh, the, the measurement, that uses that technology, and I, I know that you have heard it talk on that. And we are currently uh, conducting a study at Imatron uh, with this program to, uh, where we use exactly the calcium um, crystals as a marker of uh, the overall process. Yeah. Can you talk about the role of arginine in the uh, chemical cycle that you alluded to slightly in the presentation? Yeah, what happened with arginine, what, what uh, the first step in that uh, cascade of uh, scientific discovery was uh, people were interested how do nitrates work? Uh, people take a vagina pancreas, they take a nitrate. What is what's the real The next step is that the uh, group in England found out it's a very simple, simple molecule, it's NO, nitric oxide. And the next step was the question where does nitric oxide come from? What's the natural source of that? And as we speak today, the most uh, important source is arginine, the amino acid arginine, where the nitric oxide, the two molecules in the nitric oxide molecule that is split off from the arginine amino acid. And the effects that are known today are probably 50, of which uh, the, the two that I showed here are the most important with respect to cardiovascular health. Number one, nitric oxide relaxes the blood vessel wall, thereby um, lowering blood pressure. Uh, the effect of that is uh, mediated uh, via the endothelial cells, the first layer of cells that produces, uh, that has receptors for this nitric oxide, and that it uses the relaxation of the entire wall. Number two, uh, the, the second most important effect of nitric oxide is that it uh, has an anti-coagulating uh, effect uh, that is mediated uh, by the platelets in, in the bloodstream. Uh, do you believe you should supplement with copper if you're taking uh, 5 grams of vitamin C? Well, copper and iron, uh, we all know that, that they are um, metals and uh, some of them are uh, in the news in a negative way associated with the increased risk. Uh, copper is, if you use it in vitro, in a cell culture, it's a pro-oxidant. Uh, it means that it can induce oxidation. At the same time, we do know that many um, enzymes use trace elements of copper uh, and they just don't function without copper. So 
I do have uh, in my recommendations that a trace amount of cover um, in there, but just a trace amount. We don't want to go uh, higher than, than just in a, a microgram range. Uh, iron, since I mentioned it, is a different story. I think there's some good reason that, uh, to assume that most of us get enough iron in the diet and supplementation is not really except for women in who lose blood during menstruation is the need to supplementation uh, of iron uh, more likely than anything else. Uh, you said that, that uh, lysine and proline are not only the structural uh, components of collagen, but that they also make the, the lipoprotein uh, globules less sticky. Yes. Uh, does hydroxyproline have that same effect? If yes. You take hydrolyzed well, that's the two questions. I don't know about the last component of your question. Hydrolyzed collagen, I don't know. But uh, hydroxylysine is the same effect on lysine. And uh, we, of course, we do, we do know that vitamin C is a hydroxylating agent. So taking vitamin C together with lysine, you get a, a high amount of hydroxylysine right there. But with respect to the collagen, whether uh, taking uh, that uh, has a similar effect, I don't know. Uh, I thought about the same questions. It's uh, with respect to cancer and shark cartilage, etc. It's obvious that there may be something going on, but I don't have a scientific answer. Yes. Uh, 
with uh, the collagen or the connective tissue uh, uh, getting loose and providing the space for these repair molecules to accumulate. So that in very brief words describes how this starts. How widely are your views accepted? In other words, how controversial are they? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I opened my evening tonight with a compliment to you guys here? Um, I really believe that the change is coming from the people and I'm very pleased that I can put on my tile page more than 20,000 people following. I'm not writing the AHA to the AMA supporting it. I'm writing 20,000 people follow this program and here's what they write. Uh, secondly, because of that, we see dramatic changes in the medical uh, community. Actually, when I wrote the paper uh, for the first time presenting the fact that heart disease can be eradicated, I sent it out to um, maybe 20 of the leading people in atherosclerosis research, among them the, the uh, head of uh, cardiology from Harvard. So he responded, he was the only guy who had the guts to respond. In 1992, he wrote me a letter. I congratulate you to this uh, uh, to this important contribution, and I'd like to let you know that we're starting our own research along these lines. I never heard again from him. I think it was a courageous start from then. But uh, uh, what we do see, however, and uh, that's some, uh, a nice little story that I'd like to uh, share with you. Um, this program that I developed is, um, is um, reaching more and more doctor's offices across the country. And you know, you can ignore if somebody, uh, if somebody has uh, 20 people on, on a certain uh, scientifically based program and writes books to eradicate nurses and whatnot, has the patents and goes on TV and so on. You can ignore 20 people, but you can't ignore 20,000. So the, uh, what we do know is that uh, this program is, uh, is uh, really um, um, swapping the doctor's offices, not only in California, but in many other states already. And uh, the AHA or the AMA, American Medical Association, is, uh, is coming under a lot of pressure. And uh, the first signs are already clearly visible. And you may recall that about uh, two months ago, three months ago, uh, there was a big blur. Um, the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association uh, came out with a study, uh, serial coronary angiography shows that by antioxidant vitamins uh, slow down the progression of atherosclerosis. June 21, 1995. A watershed event. A watershed event. A turnaround of a hundred years of bias and obstruction of vitamins by the by the largest representation of the medical doctors, not all doctors are in the AMA. I looked at the study and you may do the same. Very interesting. There was no study. What they did is they looked into their, uh, the pressure was on and they didn't know what to do. They looked in their drawers and there was no. They had to come up with an answer that they didn't have. So they looked in what form of, uh, of what we do. So they came up with the idea of publishing an article that's based on a 10 year old study. So 10 years ago there was a, a drug study on the cholesterol lowering agent. As a byproduct of that study, uh, the patients were interviewed about their nutritional habits and they had to fill out little cards how much they finish and pizza so they eat. Uh, questionnaire? Questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> so you can ask the question, what are the chances that the Journal of the American Medical Association puts out 
a 10 year old study based on a nutritional questionnaire on the number one health problem, reversing a 100 year old policy without any pressure. I think it's about like as likely as the North Pole melting tomorrow. <laughs> so we do see that there's a lot of bad behavior coming on, and what I think, what is our response, my responsibility, those who are working with me along the line, is that we we understand the big psychological problem behind them, and we don't uh, we don't look down. We, we we give our hands. We say, here we are. Uh, here are the books. Uh, you know, come to uh, the talks and, 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 and read the books and apply the program. And especially since I think there's a big difference between the general uh, between the leadership of the AMA and the thousands of doctors who are really interested in their, doc in their patient's health. Mm -hmm. And I'm more interested in these doctors who, who really are concerned about their health than talking about the executives. They'll call them. They'll call them. Okay. Yeah. Have you uh, had any pressure from the Food and Drug Administration for making these health claims for this unapproved product? Well, I'm not making health claims here. I'm telling you a story. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's a big difference. Okay. Uh, number two is, uh, that also leads me to, uh, are we still in time here? Yes. <coughs> are you kidding? The, the FDA, you know, all of you know about their efforts uh, two years ago to make vitamins prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to have an answer. Why did they come with a crazy idea like that in 1991? <laughs> Why was it the hardest attack that they've done in 20 years. And the answer to that is what you just heard today. The breakthrough is cardiovascular disease, publications on the possibility to eradicate heart disease. No one has done that before. And my association with Linus Pauling at the time certainly added uh, some additional attention to this breakthrough. So these guys understood that if this is true, then there was no reason why they shouldn't understand that this is true. A uh, hundred billion dollar industry is just collapsing, about to collapse. Pleasure. And so there was run this DFDA, and I think the smartest approach from the side of the pharmaceutical industry, industry was not to say this is wrong, because everyone who doubts the connection between vitamin C and collagen is just plain stupid. So they couldn't do that. So the only idea they had was to use the FDA and, 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 and crack down on the whole thing. And that's what they tried. That's what they tried. So I think what, uh, what my response, of course I knew about that connection and so I had to get out my first book, Eradicating Heart Disease, as fast as possible and as understandable as possible. So the picture, those of you who read my books, they're full of pictures. Very important, very important step to make things understandable for everyone. My open letter to President Clinton circulated in the health food stores across the country. So I try to do my best to support this effort of millions of people uh, from the science and medicine point of view. And very interestingly, and, and uh, concluding that remark, but uh, three months ago I had a a meeting uh, on that specific question uh, that was uh, brought together by one of my attorneys and he said, you got to have some advice from an FDA attorney. So I said, that's fine. So um, uh, the meeting started and the guy introduced himself and he was the former commissioner of the FDA who is now in private practice and advises. Uh, yeah. It was a very remarkable meeting because I was sitting there with a book of educating heart disease and vitamins on the table. And the guy didn't really know what he was doing there. So the meeting went very interesting, but the most interesting sentence was, he said, the FDA got beaten with the legislation last year like never before in their history. And you, you did that. People in America did that. It wasn't any lobby of I mean, it was, I could only support it a little bit. Millions of people did that. The significance of that victory for human health worldwide is only about to be understood. How? If they would have succeeded on that, it would, it would have been a worldwide setback for, for human health. And the fact that they couldn't do that 
enables me to be speaking more freely now other people do. And, and it will and it will be like an avalanche. Uh, more people will do scientific clinical studies, scientific innovation advisory programs. And I'm not gonna be the only one. I think it's gonna be the industry will just as a whole go in that direction. And that's wonderful. That's that's what we've been looking for since fifty years. I answered you a little bit longer, but I think it was an important point. Yes, please. Sponsors to that, does that have now? I don't know, right? Yeah. The, the five, five representatives sponsored the bill and putting it down. I don't know how many co sponsors is on it. But just to let you know, there's very little political activism taking place in the United States right now. Everybody thought they won the war and went home. And so there's very little lobbying going on, very few letters being written. People need to realize that there are some major holes in this bill that Henry Waxman and his chief counsel, Bill Schultz, put into that dietary supplement bill to give the FDA the power to do drastic things to the industry if they thought they could get away with it politically. So it's not that the battle is won, it's just a couple of major points were made, but the FDA still has 80% of their arbitrary power to influence dietary supplements. I'd like to add something to that. The FDA has already started down the program. Two weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, and a week ago on day one on television, they had begun a program attacking vitamins as dangerous. They have resurrected the tryptophan situation. In fact, the day one program had 10 people from tryptophan, and they're saying these things are dangerous, 
They need to be supervised. Vitamin companies are not supervised. You don't know what you're getting. I don't know how to have it be anything. You don't know what the public is. You don't know what the treatment is. These are dangerous, unregulated substances. So the FDA has already started this in a very big way because of the bills which have been introduced in Congress. Well, and they're very effective, too, at reaching the Senate and the, the people on the Hill. They're right there locally. And for every, for every one Dr. Rath who can provide a letter, there are 10 contacts by FDA people who put out an obstacle to use. Oh, yeah, the, but don't forget the, the number of uh, pharmaceutical lobbyists is twice the number of you know, representatives in Washington. So uh, I support both assessment, of course, here. Um, when I said victory, it was a partial victory that opened up the opportunity to seek for a further solution. But nevertheless, it was a very important victory in the first attempt. And we have gone here totally the other way. And uh, once again, the, uh, the, the, uh, the final, anything that we will succeed in that direction will come from the people, not from the AMA Citizens for Health organizations like that who, who bring together the the talks properly. Yeah. I would like a small footnote to uh, what Dr. Ed said about the book uh, Deadly Medicine. I'd like to uh, refer you to it more specifically. Uh, it's a book by Thomas More, M O O R E, two O's. It, uh, it just came out in the last year or so. This the scandal of the 50,000 people dying is documented with great precision and objectivity by this, this outstanding scientific journalist, Thomas Moore. Uh, it happened in the last five years or so. The book is available at Barnes & Noble. Thomas Moore also has another book, Lifespan, where he uh, lays out other crazy Alice Wonderland FDA stories and the pharmaceutical industry uh, control of public opinion. <clears throat> so if you'd like to educate yourself about the FDA, I recommend both of those books by Thomas Moore. The first, the first one that you mentioned tonight is deadly medicine. I mean, it's almost unbelievable that 50,000 people were killed by this, and we never, we, no one's ever heard about it. But if you want to know the facts, take a look at that book, decide for yourself. By the way, I mean, man has a marvelous job. Yeah, and the other book is Lifespan. The Lifespan by Thomas Morales. So it's like a shuttle for the cell 
fuel going back and forth. That's the most important known function of carnitine. There are other functions too, it's, uh, uh, but uh, it won't go too far uh, to go into that. But carnitine codes up to 10, it's extremely important for people with heart failure. <laughs> Friday. 